Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Governors for Schools uh, webinar. The focus of today's webinar is uh, using performance data in schools. And uh, just like to welcome you and uh, just point out that hopefully you can all see the dashboard in front of you. If you'd like to ask questions at any time, we have got a rather large number of uh, uh, colleagues joining us this morning, which is fantastic. Um, but please, an apology in advance. If we don't get around to asking your question individually, please don't be offended. What we will do is try and group the questions and themes and respond to those. But please don't let that stop you uh, asking questions as, as, as we go through the session. Uh, my name is Steve Barker, and I'm joined by my colleague, Linda Waghorn, this morning. Good morning. And uh, we're here um, from Better Governor, and uh, this is one of a series of webinars that we do for Governors for Schools. And uh, as I say, this is a, a session that's deliberately put together for you. So please, if anything isn't clear, it's our problem, not yours, to so do ask us as we're going through. So what we're trying to do in the session this morning is uh, on this, uh, this slide that's actually in front of you now. Um, we're going to take us uh, through both a primary approach because the primary data is already uh, available, but also a, a, an approach that is equally applicable to whatever um, setting you are in. So if you're a secondary school governor or trustee, uh, the approach, the, the um, way in which your governance is affected by, by data should be very similar. You're just dealing with slightly larger uh, groups of, of um, data and information. Um, but we're going to have a look at uh, primarily the performance data reports that the DfE uh, publish and the Ofsted use when they're framing an inspection. We're going to look then from a governance perspective, how do we use uh, those um, reports uh, and what uh, key messages we can glean from them uh, and use these to shape uh, and to encourage discussion and debate at school, um, which uh, will then fuel that last bullet point about equipping you uh, to better ask questions uh, as governors and trustees in your own context and setting. And I think one point just to make before we, we move on, folks, is that certainly I know Linda and I are of one mind on this one, that what we should always do when we're thinking about data, whether it's finance data or performance data, which obviously is the focus of today's webinar, data doesn't provide answers. All data does for us is actually fuel our questions as governors. And I think that's a really important um, springboard to uh, launch into this webinar from. So there are two key data reports, as Linda's uh, um, already said, and uh, that slide is really just a marker for you just to uh, remind you what those um, acronyms and uh, abbreviations actually stand for. ASP, some of you may remember a report called Raise Online if you've been governors for a while. A ASP is the uh, evolved um, form of the old Raise Online report, Analyze School Performance, and this is produced by the Department for Education and uh, all schools can access this and that's supplemented by the inspection data summary report which is using the same data but this one is actually put together by Ofsted and a bit of a health warning on this at the moment the current versions of IDSR that are actually in your schools do not contain all of the uh, the latest data so there's a, a, a little bit of a health warning that we'll pick up in just a moment on that. So if we think of the first level for governors, we'll probably start with the inspection data summary report because it gives us a fairly headline approach uh, to uh, our school's performance and trend over the past three years and how our school's performance compares to national figures. So pulling together all of this information, the um, the DfE have produced this headline report that says this is the place in which you can start. What is really helpful about this for, um, for governors and trustees is that uh, the way in which it, the template is put together, it gives you some key pieces of information uh, from which to uh, act as a sounding board for what you might need to ask uh, more. The release date, as you see this uh, slide shows you the the release information, this is provisional information um, at this stage, and that will be validated in the spring next year. But this is usually the time of year when governors and trustees in primary schools will be discussing this information. They've just set the school development plan uh, and they will be checking that their priorities 
are in line with their performance. Um, for secondary schools, this information will not be issued until uh, towards the end of this calendar year, possibly even the beginning of January. And just one other point to make on that, and this ties into a question that Brendan's just uh, um, posted. The data is provisional and a lot of governing bodies, a lot of trust boards have already looked at this, will recognise that some of the finance data, which is also being included in IDSR this year for the first time, is also wildly inaccurate. Some of it doesn't actually make sense. I think the one point to actually take on board with everything in IDSR, all of the commentary, and it is a, re a report that is driven by a lot of commentary, the commentary is actually generated by computer algorithms. So it's an analysis of the data and it will churn out sentences, statements based on that data. Now, if there are some imperfections in the data, those need to be corrected before one can rely with uh, any great deal of um, certainty on some of those statements that are coming out. And a very good example, uh, Linda's just said the provisional data, that is so that schools can check. So if you're a governor and going to a meeting um, in the next few weeks where data is actually being the focus for discussion, ask the head teacher, ask the data lead in your school, have we checked that the data is accurate? If it isn't, have we reported back? Because it's only through schools reporting back on those areas of inaccuracy. And it might be finance data, but it might be the number of looked after children you've got. It might be the number of boys versus girls that you've got, or even the number that sat the test. So all of those things have to be um, straightened out before the um, validated data is actually published in the spring term. And uh, also, this information is uh, is shared at this stage with the understanding that um, head teachers won't just give you the report and not uh, provide a commentary and an explanation. Uh, they will have already looked at this in some detail uh, before it comes for discussion at your governing body meeting and be able to talk you through uh, some of both the inaccuracies and whether they've uh, reported them uh, and also some contextualization of, of some of this information as we'll see as we go through. The second little uh, uh, circle on that um, screenshot that you see at the moment is around some comments uh, that are on the report itself. So where they're in that very light grey uh, area, then those are things which have not thrown up uh, anything from the data which warrants further discussion, um, but there will be comments that will be in a darker grey colour and those are ones which will give you some information on which to base your first line questions as governors about, well, what do we understand about this? And we'll talk a little bit more as we, we go along. Uh, the greyed out area on the report, uh, that just covers up the information about your particular school. So, so you'll see the information that is relevant uh, to your school and your leadership. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the next slide because then you can see that in action. So what we've done is stripped out all of the pale grey sentences because they're either there because, as Linda said, there isn't sufficient data or there is a general principle at the moment that applies both to the IDSR report and to the analysed school performance, and that is that the looked after children data is not yet available. That has not been um, correlated and analysed by the department yet. And because of that, there is no data either for disadvantaged pupils and that's because looked after children are part of that group, of course. But what you do see on this one is the, uh, um, certainly there's some common features in all of these reports. They tend, they don't tend, they do always go in the order of reading, writing and maths, and they always go top of the school down to uh, the bottom. So they'll start at key stage two if you're a, if you're a primary and go down to key stage one. And similarly um, in secondary, they'll start at the, at the top of the school there as well. And there is always a comment on absence at the bottom. And they'll start with progress uh, and then go on to attainment. So they'll make comments um, where relevant in each of those areas. The, on the gov.uk website, there is a, a very good guidance document for governors um, to help you unpick the IDSR with some samples like this. And there are versions both for primary and secondary. So this, if this is a new area to you and you're coming up to your meetings where you'll be discussing this, looking at the guidance might also uh, add a background, uh, some background information for you. There's a 
um, comment here from Rosemary. Rosemary saying secondary IDSRs have already been released. Um, it's not actually about release, Rosemary. There is always an IDSR on the website um, for your school. It's about when it's updated. Yes, it's out there for secondary at the moment, but if you look at the small print, it's all last year's data. I haven't, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, I haven't seen one yet with this year's data on. So sorry if, if we've confused people. We're not saying it's not there. We're saying that the version that is live on the site at the moment has not been updated with the 2019 data. So again, one of the key messages that we give that we give to governors, I've already said that uh, um, yeah, we're not we're not expecting data to actually uh, uh, provide answers for us. We are expecting it to uh, um, inform our questions. But we should also be thinking about data from the perspective of how useful is this to us? How does this inform our knowledge as governors about the strengths and um, uh, relative uh, areas for improvement in our school? And in order to do that, we have to be able to discern what are the key messages coming out of the data. Now, there's nothing magical about you know, the, the number three. I just happen to like it. My birthday's on the third, but I'm sure that's got no bearing on it at all. Um, but very often, it's helpful to say, to say to ourselves as governors, and actually, we all often give the message to head teachers or data leads as well, to say, what are the three key messages I take from this, or I want governors, if I'm a head teacher or a data lead, to take away from this data? So you can see these statements, and we're not going to go through these statements, you can read those for yourselves on the current slide, but you will see that on, on, for example, both the reading and the writing where it's talking about progress in key stage two, uh, you will see that it's still making progress comments based on the previous years. So this isn't the 1819 data, this is the 1718 data. And the relevance of this, of course, is that this is Oster's report, and until the IDSR is updated, this is the progress data that they will look at on coming into the school. Um, we've got a couple of people putting messages up at the moment asking if there's a technical problem. We're not aware of one at our end. Um, if you can't see the screen at the moment, I would suggest that perhaps you reboot your machine and uh, see if you can uh, uh, get your vision back that way. And certainly as far as so going back onto this slide now, where it relates to the current year data, you will um, see that they do actually mention 2019. So you've got some progress um, comments which relate to the previous year, but where it's talking about attainment. So on writing, for example, it says key stage one attainment at the expected standard. And then the percentage there is the percent of children in that particular school in key stage one who sat the test and reached that level. And obviously then it's making a comment about where they sit in the national rankings but it does specifically tell you that's 2019. So from our perspective, what we're saying is, what messages we take away from this as governors, and the three key messages on this should be that there is a question mark over writing because of the, of the low attainment there, similarly in maths, and then the bottom one, there is a comment about attendance compared to similar schools. Now, it doesn't matter what those messages are. Obviously, this is an anonymous report we're using today. The point is, that we have taken three messages away from that, and those are the areas that should be you know, perhaps uh, the focus of some questions from governors. And of course, the the report is is a generic in terms that it's drawn information from uh, the data, but the discussions that you have with your senior leaders in school to interpret and unpick the why and the how and the what is happening uh, next is is very significant in your um, holding the school to account. So being able to analyse, well, what is happening in writing? Where do we think we are? What has the school been doing about it? Uh, and this, similarly with, with the other areas, and um, are there is there more contextual information that help us unpick and understand the situation? Uh, and what has been the impact of the school's approach to improving progress in those areas. So those are the key things that those headline statements should prompt us to have our discussions uh, with our senior leads about. Now, sorry, if there's a couple of questions come through. If we skipped too quickly over that last slide, let me just flick it back for you. Sorry, wrong way. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see where the cursor is. I hope you can now, but here on progress, so this first one on reading, key stage two progress, and it tells you it's for the previous year, 2017 to 2018. If you drop down to writing where it makes the comment about key stage one attainment, there 
it's specifically relating to 2019. That was the comment that we were making. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, so if we, we should, as governors and trustees, be aware from the work that we do in our governing body meetings and our visits that we make to school and the analysis and reading that we do of the documents that we're provided with, this should not come as a surprise. We will have talked uh, uh, about early stage performance outcomes at the beginning of the autumn term. It would have fed in to our school development planning um, in both primary and secondary. So there shouldn't be any surprise when we see this data. There may be some contextualization and some explanation um, and some deeper conversations, but what we should be using these reports to do is to increase our awareness. So has the school updated its self-evaluation document, um, uh, so particularly as we've had a new Ofsted framework, many schools have looked at how they um, undertake school self-evaluation and reshaped it around the new Ofsted judgments. Uh, but are we aware of the evidence-based decisions and judgments the school has made about its current strengths and the areas for development? And have we as governors participated in through the work we've done in, in meetings, through our approval of the school development plan, how, are we confident that we have assured that the school has made a plan that engages with development of those areas of weakness? Uh, and then we should be able to see through looking at the IDSR that if uh, writing was an issue, which we should be aware of because we've said it's no surprising, no surprises, we should then be aware of the actions the school is taking in its school development process uh, to address um, writing it, it either in that key stage one area or in the area in which the report is indicating um, outcomes are still not good enough for pupils. Uh, and then finally, because we've now got a plan that is appropriate to address the development areas that have been identified through the data on performance, we are then uh, in a good position as we move through the year to hold the school to account by looking at the performance data, the progress data, the outcomes from the actions that are being taken, be it around the curriculum, be it around uh, the way money is spent on pupil premium or on SEND, to say, are the actions the school are, are taking, have we got evidence that they are having an impact, they are moving pupils forward in their learning in these areas that we've identified. And that whole culture of no surprises really is predicated on that uh, assertion. They said, the data fuels our questions as governors. And exactly the same way, that's why Ofsted use it. It's called an inspection data summary report. It summarizes the data, but it summarizes the hard data and actually it almost actually generates some questions or the basis of questions from Ofsted. And there's a couple of questions coming through on the, uh, um, the dashboard our end here about how Ofsted use this and yes absolutely Ofsted will be looking at this whether it's been updated or not and using that to form the basis of inspection trails when they come to visit our schools um, and I think that that's something that we do need to actually think about there's a question here from Bill about Ofsted not using internal data um, that's a, it's a very good question Bill because yeah Ofsted made it very clear that they are not going to spend time during inspections pouring over schools internal data that does not mean they don't expect us as governors to know what the internal data says to us um, schools should be using internal data but what Ofsted are now interested in is saying, okay, what does the data say, say to you? So in terms of those three key messages, if the data is telling you in your school, writing is an issue, early years, foundation stage, percentage of pupils getting good level of development, and maybe key stage one maths are the three key areas, Ofsted will be saying, okay, so what have you done about it? Show me. They don't want to see the data, they want to know what you've done based on what the data has actually told you as a school, and that includes us as governors. Okay, so we're going to move away from IDSR now and actually uh, move on to the Analyzed School Performance, the ASP report. And again, as Linda said for um, IDSR, 
the big box on this one again is just to uh, um, cover up the school's identity because schools have very kindly lent us their data for the uh, purpose of today's um, seminar but obviously it would be inappropriate to uh, say who they were because this is confidential data none of this is actually uh, uh, in the public domain as such and again, you will see on this um, slide in front of you, I'm just hovering the uh, cursor at the moment, this is provisional data for 2018-19 in ASP, and CLA just stands for children looked after. Some of you may be more familiar with LAC, which is looked after children, means the same thing. But because that data is not available at, at this particular point in time, um, the breakdowns for looked after children and because they are part of the group known as disadvantaged children, they are not available at this point in time either. And it's just making the point underneath that that updates will uh, will come through as and when that data is available. So the first chart that you've got on the bottom of this slide is a really a, to a top level key stage two uh, performance indicator looking at the three um, core subjects, reading, writing and maths in that order. And you can see at the bottom there that uh, you've got um, each of those subject headings is actually in bold and immediately underneath that you have a um, number of pupils. A number of pupils there means the number of pupils where it is possible to um, look at a progress measure. Progress is measured from key stage one um, outcomes in terms of SATS results to the end of key stage two. And it's very important to actually look at the number here because it may well be, and in fact it will, you'll see on the, uh, the next slide hopefully, uh, that the numbers will be slightly different possibly, children who actually sat the test and those where there is a progress measure. And that's simply a reflection of those children in your school where there isn't available match data. So it may well be that they've come from overseas, they could have actually transferred in from the independent sector into the state sector. Uh, but any child that actually transfers from a school in England, and it is England because Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own education systems, any child that transfers in will have their own unique pupil reference number and their data will be captured by the uh, school that they're coming into. So here we've got 27 children. No adjusted scores, that would normally be adjusted for children with um, uh, perhaps uh, very specific um, special educational needs, disabilities, etc. And this is giving you a progress measure. And uh, it's a traffic light system we use here. So the yellow actually indicates that this is an overall average banding. And progress is usually um, denoted on what Americans call a bell curve, or we would probably more likely call a normal distribution curve. And the midpoint, the average point, is zero. So anything that is above zero would be seen as a positive score, and obviously the negative score is below zero. But given the confidence intervals, i.e. The, uh, the range with, when, within which, because of the sample size, uh, we can say that uh, the the specific number uh, definitely falls within that range. That's why you're getting an average score here, because if we just take the example of reading, where I have the cursor at the moment, we have a, a, a average progress for the school of minus 1.64, but the confidence interval just below that says that the number could be anywhere between minus four and 0.7, and obviously 0.7 is a positive score, so that's why the overall result has been judged as, as, as average there. And of course, this is an average of all of the 27 children who sat the test, but also had key stage one data to compare it with. A couple of questions around those of you that uh, are not a primary school, so it might be an infant school or a secondary school, because we're using the slides from the primary release as uh, indicators. Um, you would have to shape your understanding of your own uh, ASP against the reports for your phase of school. So um, an infant school, it's, there's going to be a very different uh, set of data, it won't include key stage two. And secondary, it will, it will look uh, very different because it is again against different um, elements of, of uh, education. Okay, just we've got a couple of questions also coming through here about my comment about the uh, the number of pupils and progress scores. Um, Kieran's asked the question, does the methodology apply to secondary? Absolutely it does. If you don't have a key stage two score, you won't have a progress a, a progress measure attached to that. So uh, yes, absolutely. And Martin's actually asking, how will we know what proportion of children um, it is out of a total? There are other slides in the the pack, other tables in the pack that do give you that uh, that information. 
Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to the next one. Again, this is the same school we're looking at here, and this is actually giving you a breakdown. As I say, this is looking at a combined um, picture for reading, writing, and maths. On the last slide, we look at them as individual subjects. This is saying what proportion of children, what percentage of children in this school who took the test got the um, expected standard, that's the age-related expectation, um, or higher in reading, writing, and mathematics. And here is a good example. You will see this is the same school. So we only had 27 children where we could do a progress measure, but this is telling you that the school clearly we know from this it's a one form entry school, had 30 children in that class. So of those 30, previous slide tells us 20, 27 of them had matched data. Now again, similar formatting through all of these, what you will always get, your school is always in the pinky magenta color that is on the top there. Uh, the local authority average, whatever your local authority or your local borough is, if you're in a metropolitan area, is the darker grey shade, and then the national average is the bar below that. So what this one is telling us for this particular school is that the top bar chart is those children who got the expected or reached the expected standard or higher, and our school, 70% of uh, children actually met the expectation, which is in line with the local authority average, and is five percentage points above the national average. And then the bar chart below that is just giving you a breakdown because obviously the upper bar chart is those who got or who reached the expect expected standard or higher, and the bottom bar chart is the higher part. So those children who um, went on to actually reach the higher standard, the school that we're looking at here, 10% is the school value, that's the one in pink, um, local authority 14 and the national average 11. So you can see that although we've done reasonably well and we're more, more or less average as the progress table implied as well, um, attainment is, is, is virtually in line with um, national average, slightly above. At the higher level, we're a little bit below that. And this is giving us a three-year trend. You've got 2017, 18, and 19, and you can see at the top, it tells you how many pupils there were in the cohort there. And this really does, I'll say one of the, the most important things for, for us, I think, when looking at all of this data is, is there a trend over time? Now, recognizing, of course, that we're talking about different cohorts of children, so we're not comparing like with like, but this shows, so if you look at the three pink bars on the uh, for, for each year here you look at the pink the pinks all together this is actually showing a picture of some fairly dramatic improvement in this particular school at a time when the national average is more or less stable um, for the last two years a little, a little bit up from 17 to 18 and the local authority average again um, more more or less uh, stable so this school is actually doing very well in comparison to the, the local of the national average and so just before we move on, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, George is asking, the adjusted pupils actually refers to clamping of extremely negative progress scores. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, George. The, um, you're saying about the confidence limits. I mean, the confidence limits are, are there just to actually give us some assurance about the validity of the data. Um, as governors, we don't need to be absolute experts on the, understand the statistical significance here. We just need to know the methodology because what Ofsted will do is take a view, is progress in this school in that band that we can with confidence say is actually an average measure, is it above average, et cetera. So we don't, as governors, I would suggest it's not for us to be uh, particularly concerned about the, uh, the mathematical explanation of that, just to understand that this is a test that the department do on it to say whether this is a statistically reliable number or not. The important thing for us as governors is to know what does that actually mean in terms of the progress, because this is individual children, it's not numbers we're talking about, these are children here, and are we assured as, uh, as governors that our children have made progress in their learning if it's a progress measure that we're looking at? Okay, so let's move on to uh, the next slide, which um, again, we're just taking a, uh, an overview here this morning, giving you an indication of some of the charts available. So we've looked at um, Key Stage 2, we've then got um, a Key Stage 1 phonics um, score here, and phonics 
is a check as opposed to a test according to the department. So the phonics check results will also be included in your ASP report. Uh, again, this is a school that uh, of, you know, looks like it's one form entry through, throughout. This is done at uh, the end of year one. 30 children again did the test and you can see here the pink bar again is the school. You can see that it's actually um, above the both the local authority and the national average here and uh, again if you were a governor of the school you'd be relatively pleased with that performance i've no doubt at all we're then looking at key stage one reports and again we've actually got a um you know blue box at the top there is just uh, hiding the name of this particular school that we look at this is a different school that we're looking at now so we've actually just varied it a little bit to get some uh, uh, an interesting perspective on the data and here you'll see the same message about looked after children data etc but what we're looking at on this one is expected standard in reading so as we said before always starts in reading then writing then maths this is looking at performance in reading at the end of key stage one so the sats that children took in the, uh, the summer of 2019 this school, you'll see where I'm hovering the cursor at the moment, 53 pupils, so immediately we know that this is a two-form entry school. And in this school, 75% of those children reached the expected standard or higher in their reading in the test this summer. That compares to a national um, average of 75 and a local average of 79. Um, there's a question from Henry asking about where to find these reports. It is a secure web-based um, access uh, and therefore your school will have the access information sent to them. There is a governor level access permitted to this and usually um, you, most schools, most governing bodies will assign a governor or two to a deeper level analysis of some of this information and therefore they would be given the secure access as a governor uh, and this is a quite a quick process. I was speaking to a governor yesterday who um, requested it from his school within 10 minutes he'd been able to um, to get on to the site and uh, and secure the information. For other governors often the uh, IDSR and key reports from the ASP are shared as part of a autumn term agenda item uh, which is designed to prompt this very discussion that we're uh, shaping with you today. So you're either a governor who has access and can look for yourself or it will be circulated and shared with you uh, as part of agenda papers. And there's an interesting question come up from Carolina here. Um, Carolina is actually saying is that the progress um, is, is measured at the end of every year versus the results of key stage one or only at the end of key stage two. Schools will obviously be looking, well, obviously hopefully be looking at progress um, at every point through a child's um, you know, career in the school. But the data that we're looking at is only end of key stage two because obviously schools will be publishing their SATS results or the teacher assessments at the end of each key stage. So progress that we're looking at here, you can only have a progress measure at key, the end of key stage two because key stage one, you can't measure progress from early years foundation stage because the curriculum is not the same. So it's a very different uh, um, perspective that we're taking. And Katie's got a question here. Does this split out SEN and pupil premium disadvantage? Um, it will, um, Katie, you might have missed the comment right at the beginning. At the moment, because looked after children data is not available, looked after is part of the set that is referred to as disadvantaged. The other and the most significant part of that is those generating pupil premium for the school. And therefore, that data is not available yet. There isn't a standard. This is unusual. Last year, it was available when the reports were first published. Um, all it says on the reports at the moment, as you can see on this page here, this information will be included in a later release, no time scale included on that. So this is just a question for head teachers, um, data leads in schools to really just keep an eye on the website because it will be updated in due course. And your school leaders will already have, have done their own analysis on how um, actual performance at the end of each key stage um, and if you're in secondary in those key subjects, um, looks across all of your pupil groups in your school because every school will have its own context of pupil groups and you will, as a consequence of your governance, be looking at 
progress and performance of those, those groups and appropriate interventions and strategies that support their learning. So you'll have a governor looking at SEND, you'll have um, a focus on the pupil premium strategy and the spend and the impact of that spend. So these reports are not designed to um, do that piece of work for you, but to provide some headlines and some place uh, to open those discussions. A couple of people asking questions about will the copy of these slides be available? Yes, it's already been uploaded onto um, the platform um, by Governors for Schools. So at any time between now and the end of the uh, webinar, and there'll be time at the end of the webinar, if you click on the little document icon, you can actually download those. Um, Somebody's uh, Nikki's asking some questions about there's quite a few questions coming up about phonics here. Is what's the maximum score for phonics? And um, the maximum score is 40. The pass mark, even though it's a check and not a test, uh, the pass mark this year is actually um, 32. Uh, but again, good to actually look at these in your own school setting rather than on, on a, a, a national basis anyway. Um, what, we, what we've got on this next one is just showing you a little bit of a breakdown. So, sorry, if I just flick back to the last, sorry, the last slide going the wrong way. Um, what you can do is click on the question mark that I'm actually hovering over there, or even view this as a table, and it will actually give you more details. I'm going the wrong way completely now, sorry. Um, and what that will do is then give you a breakdown, so you can see here, looking at some of these groups and this is where once that looked after children and disadvantaged children data is available those lines will be added to this table so this table here this is looking at key stage one it's attainment in other words performance in the test this isn't progress because we don't have progress for key stage one but you will get this sort of breakdown for secondary and for but for uh, um, through primary key stage two as well but what this is saying is that for each level in reading that we we can actually report on, it will tell you what the split is against these various characteristics. So we've got all pupils, the cohort, we remember there was 53 children in this particular cohort who sat the test, then the gender split, um, special educational needs with an educational healthcare plan, EHCP. Um, those who don't have an educational healthcare plan, but nonetheless are receiving special educational needs support, those with no S special educational needs, English as a first language, and those with English as a, an additional or a secondary language. Now, the important thing to note on this table, and again, you'll get something similar for uh, all, all other as well. You might remember from the slides we looked at that looked at reading attainment, it always says those achieving the expected standard or higher. Now, that's this block here where I'm hovering the cursor now. Now, obviously, those at greater depth are included, they're a subset of here. So you, if you need to imagine perhaps a, a red line going down this part, because then everything to the right of that on the screen in front of you, those working towards and those at pre-key pre stage, that is your total school population. So the numbers there will add up to 100%, but that excludes those at greater depth because they are a subset of this group here. So we've got working towards those who didn't make the expected um, standard at the end of key stage one, and then the pre-key stage one, those will be the children who perhaps previously might have been operating on what was called P-scales, usually but not always children with special needs who perhaps are not accessing a full key stage one curriculum at this stage, and therefore it would be wrong to actually yeah, judge them against that. And let's see, we've got a few more questions. Uh, Keith is asking, would we, would we be able to find out if progress is made at the top end of ability or the lower end? Um, yes, certainly at key, at key stage two, um, it does give you a breakdown. And again, at secondary, it will give you a breakdown based on prior attainment, lower, lower attaining, middle attaining and higher attaining groups. So absolutely, you would be able to do that. We haven't gone into that level of detail this morning just because of uh, the time that's actually available to us, Keith, but certainly that's best done in your own school environment. Um, and we've got a question from Sammy. What happens to pupils whose key stage one or two data is not available? Um, you just don't have a progress score uh, um, for them represented in the tables. But most schools, um, Sammy, would actually be looking, I'm guessing, at doing some kind of assessment on entry when those children join the school at whatever time they 
join the school, whether that's at the beginning of the key stage, either, at year, either in year seven if it's secondary, or year three if it's a, a key stage two school, um, you would be doing some kind of test to get a benchmark because then the school would be able to look at its own progress. And there are schools where mobility is a significant issue, and very often if you're a governor in a school where you know that there's a lot of mobility, and mobility is those children coming and going at times other than the beginning of uh, the school year in the appropriate year group and leaving at the end of key, at the end of the key stage what you what you will find in those schools very often is that schools tend to talk about the homegrown children so those were the children who have been there throughout you know the, the time we would expect all children to be in the school but that's a measure of those children who had the experience, hopefully, of consistently good teaching in your school. But you would also need to look at what your offer is and how you support other children. Okay, let's uh, move on at that stage and look at, um, what does this say to us in terms of the questions that as governors we might want to ask, having looked at the data? So clearly some schools will have much greater number of children with special educational needs and disabilities or uh, come from a disadvantaged background and attract pupil premium funding or come from a specific pupil group. And in this example, Gypsy Roma Traveller is the GRT um, uh, acronym. And, and it's important that you understand as governors and trustees what your local context is in your school, what your groups how significant um, including or excluding their um, attainment uh, from the figures uh, compares with your um, local authority or national averages so that you understand uh, the impact of, of what the school is doing to meet those people's needs. So for example, some of your children, uh, some of your SEN uh, D children who have education and healthcare plans their expectations in test results may look very different in ter terms of, uh, of your whole school community. So again, it is about the design and the application of learning for pupils from all of those groups being appropriate for them um, and understanding then, if we go into that next bullet point, how your school is actually addressing learning for those pupils? Is it appropriate? Is there any additional funding? What has been the impact of applying both those different approaches and applying the use of that funding to support those different approaches? Uh, and importantly around the new offset expectations, most schools will be engaged in some kind of review of their curriculum and how it meets the needs of all pupils and how the implementation of any changes to that is supporting improvement. So if we think back to the earlier slides about um, improving writing, what is the approach to writing in terms of curriculum design? What are our pupil groups that are significant to our school? How have approaches been adapted? How have we used additional funding to support those pupils making better progress and achieving better attainment? And then importantly, if we look at whole school, and those groups uh, individually and collectively, as governors and trustees, what evidence do we need to see, have shared with us, to visit and see for ourselves so that we can monitor that progress is being made and we can uh, achieve that degree of confidence that how we have understood the data and the plans the school have made to use that data to shape learning is having the required impact on pupils learning and again don't forget this data is looking if you're a key stage one only school this is looking at last academic year's data those children no longer in your school or even if it's a through primary these are youngsters now who have actually moved on into the next key stage and similarly secondary data if you've got a sixth form those children may now be in your those youngsters may now be in your sixth form or they may have moved on somewhere else so this isn't about you know, a preoccupation and inquest on what's happened in the past. This is a, how does this 
in, in, inform that evolving picture of school performance. So although we made the point earlier in response to a question that Ofsted don't expect to spend time poring over internal data, everything that Lind has just said on these questions is absolutely informed by in, of the internal data as well as the data that's actually published by the department here. So this is about ensuring as governors we continually update that self-evaluative view we have of the school. And ideally, as we said in the slide earlier about no surprises, the IDSR and the ASP reports shouldn't tell you anything that you don't already know as governors. The important thing is that it confirms the, the information and it gives you that external validation for what you've been told is happening in your school. And then your internal performance data is helping you to monitor uh, the improvements, the actions the school have put in place to uh, improve the school further in some of those areas. Uh, we've got a question coming here from Anthony. Um, Anthony just is asking, how is the expected standard defined? Uh, the inspector of the expected standard has changed a couple of years back now. We used to have national curriculum levels, and some of you were perhaps the governors at the time, or maybe parents of children's schools, will know that we had you know level one, level two, level three, etc. Those levels have disappeared now, and instead there is an age-related expectation defined by central government, which is based on the national curriculum and the skills, the knowledge that children are expected to have at the end of Key Stage 1, the end of Key Stage 2, and obviously if it's secondary, um, based on the end of Key Stage 4, when they're actually uh, um, taking GCSEs or equipment. So that, that knowledge, that understanding, and the skills associated with that, they are tested either through GCSEs or through SATS tests, et cetera, and the government define the pass mark for those. So that's what's meant by the age-related expectation there. And again, uh, most schools will provide performance data the data you see on a termly basis um, that will be shaped around uh, those um, age-related expectations. And we've got quite a lot of questions coming through again about pupil premium. Don't forget pupil premium data, as we said, that's not available at the moment. That, that might change today, it might change next week, it might change middle of December. We don't know because the DfE haven't said that yet. But what we do need to ensure is that we continually are asking the question, somebody in our schools, because it doesn't necessarily have to be us, as Linda said earlier, somebody in the schools is keeping an eye open for when the tables are updated, because we will absolutely need to look at that data for disadvantaged pupils the moment it is actually published. And hopefully you will have spent some time this um, early this term looking at the pupil premium strategy for your school. Uh, and again, when that information is published, there shouldn't be a surprise, because you should already have picked up those areas uh, and, and how you're going to spend that money and with what impact you're expecting uh, to see support for those pupils. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, launch, a, launch a poll at this stage and uh, we got an opinion poll this morning which I'm just about to uh, launch and hopefully you can uh, see that on your slide now. And uh, question we're asking is how moving forward from today do you think your governing board or your governing body will use the um, analysed school performance in the IDSR report? And you've got four choices there, and I can see a few people who are beginning to vote already. So if you'd like to just scan down those and uh, vote now, and uh, we'll close the poll in a few moments and uh, share the results with you. Okay, so we've got about 60% of you have voted so far. So if you would cast your votes now, we'd be very grateful. Okay, well, nearly everybody has voted now, so just a couple more moments and then we will actually close the poll. Yep, that looks like everybody's voted now is going to, so thank you for that. We will close the poll, which then enables us to actually share those results with you. Slight delay on that, but hopefully that, ha that has actually uh, uh, come up on your screens now. You can see that bar chart and uh, quite, a, quite a spread of responses there. Yep, have some, some are making comments that you've already uh, had that uh, discussion at your governing body meeting, which is great. Uh, and some of you saying that it is both two and three, discussion on your next agenda, and you have a data governor with that ASP access, which is a great combination because that can help prompt discussion at that deeper level. 
I think one of the things that we would we would say, of course, is that if, you know if if you said you're not certain at this stage, that's fine. Again, go back, ask the question. I would suggest. And one of the things that I think both Linda and I would say, and I think most other uh, people involved in governance would say, everybody in every school at uh, operating within governance now ought to know those key facts, those key messages coming out of the data. It's no longer acceptable in governance in um, 2019 going into 2020 for governors to make comments like, oh, well, I don't do performance data. I sit on the finance, the resources committee, etc." Our schools are primarily about children's learning and the performance data is the best way of uh, governors seeking assurance that that's actually happening in a positive way. So all of us ought to know this. So this should be somewhere, even if it's just a, you know, a half hour or you know, 40 minute summary session that says these are, these are the key data sets that we've actually looked at, these are the messages that governors need to take away from them, and then based on all of those questions that we've just been looking at, we know the answer to so, you know, the so what question. So this is what the data is telling us, but so what are we doing about it? And hopefully we've moved away from the complex uh, tables and reports of raised online in the past where head teachers are often reluctant to share the reports with governors because they claimed they wouldn't understand them. But these, the IDSR report is absolutely essential that governors see that. It is what uh, Ofsted will use as their starting point, and I would suggest that it is a, a point at which governors and trustees should have a starting point for discussion. And that just about brings us to uh, the end of uh, uh, all that we wanted to say this morning, folks. But if there are any additional questions, and now's the uh, opportunity to uh, put those to us, and we'll do our level best to be able to respond to them. Uh, I should just say thank you very much for all the questions. And we've got a lot of people on the webinar this morning, and uh, so there have been a lot of questions. Apologies if we didn't actually mention you by name, but hopefully all of the questions that came through um, we have responded to um, in perhaps in, gen in general terms. Uh, just to answer Fiona's question about could I supply the link to the governor guidance that I uh, referred to, if you go on the <coughs> excuse me DFE webpage itself, the gov.uk one, or do a general search for IDSR guidance 2019, you should find that fairly easily. Um, we've got one question coming here from Helen. What's your view of uh, FFT information the heads give us? FFT is Fisher Family Trust. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's a state secret. Fisher Family Trust do actually process the information that is actually contained with ASP. Um, they are using the same data. Um, Fisher Family Trust use a dashboard approach to it. It's just a slightly different way of looking at the data. Um, dependent on its availability, there's no reason at all why you shouldn't look at that. Schools, however, always need to know what um, ASP and particularly IDSR look at because as and when Ofsted do come to call, they're the reports that they'll be looking at. So it's no, yeah, there won't be very different messages, but there could be a slightly different interpretation on um, the F FFT data just because it looks at it in a slightly different way. But no, um, again, the way the school does its own data, some schools will be looking at uh, um, buying in uh, proprietary bits of software to analyze their internal data. Some will just be doing it on a, um, a spreadsheet of their own. It doesn't matter how you do it, it's about how you interpret the data and then keep up again, we keep coming back to this, what are we doing about the messages the data give to us? A uh, couple of questions here from uh, Tony. Tony saying, we're a new school we opened in September this year. What would you recommend as the best way to monitor progress in the absence of trend data? Um, well, certainly from your, I'm sure your head teacher and the teachers in your school, one of the most important things they'll be doing, of course, is assessing children's work on an ongoing basis. Now, it's not for us as governors to look at individual named children's work, but for teachers to actually give um, governors an overview of what their um, book scrutiny or work scrutiny is actually telling them. Um, one of the things that Ofsted will do, they won't come into a bracket new school quite as early as that, but in any school Ofsted go into um, this term, what they'll be doing is when they're going into uh, visit classrooms, they'll be picking up children's books. So hopefully they might ask them first if they can look at their books, but they'll be picking up a child's book. They'll go to the front page and look at the sort of standard that's actually being reflected there. And they'll go to where the child is working at the moment, and they'll be making some professionally informed judgments about what that looks like in terms of progress. And again, you would be expecting teachers right the way through from early years foundation stage up to sixth form to actually be making similar judgments on an ongoing basis. Are pupils, whatever their age, making the progress that we want them to?
we've got one or two other questions about how will Ofsted view junior school progress data where key stage one data is reported by another school. Um, it doesn't matter where it comes from. As I say, if you've got children moving in and out of your school, sorry, this is a question from Lynn. Um, the, the data is the data. It's the nationally recorded data. Um, if your school is actually saying you don't like the data that comes from other schools or you don't think it's reliable, that will usually be followed by a question from Austin. So what are you doing about it? One of the things that you might want to do if you're not already is engaging perhaps in some meaningful moderation across schools so that you all have a shared understanding of what um, age-related expectation or achieving age-related expectation actually looks like. And some junior schools will, will have their own tests for pupils on entry if they've come uh, you know, it's, it's a separate junior school uh, in the same way that uh, many secondaries uh, perform some kind of test at the beginning of year seven. Okay, quick question here from Anthony. Anthony is saying, how do we distinguish between attainment and achievement? Um, very simple, um, um, Anthony. Achievement usually in the context of performance data relates to progress. In other words, how far has a child or a young person's learning moved from the end of one key stage to the end of another? Attainment is simply a reflection of performance at a test. So the, attainment is the scores on the doors bit. Achievement tends to be used as a synonym for progress. Um, Nikki's making a point here, as a small infant school, school one form entry, the IDSR says very little. Is this still the case that low cohort data, as in fewer than 10 pupils, will not show up? Yeah, it absolutely is. And of course, if, if, if there are fewer than 10 pupils and the data is, you know, you have very dubious uh, statistical significance on data with a cohort as small as that, it becomes even more imperative to look at the school's own data and draw your conclusions about that. You still have to publish your um, attainment data, of course, on your website. That's a statutory requirement for everybody. So it's about saying, OK, what does that data tell us, that attainment data, in terms of the progress that those children have made since they began in the key stage, even if there isn't any formal progress data? And Question here from Helen. Ofsted includes a statement in the IDSR about junior school and UTC data. Um, helpful word of warning. I'm not quite sure what you mean by UTC. UTC is um, yeah, um, Universal Technical College, so that's, that's nothing to do with key stage um, one or two at all. So I'm not quite sure what you mean on that one, Hel Helena, so apologies. Um, Right, question from Margaret at the end here. This will have to be the last question, folks, because we're running out of time now. Right through the DSR report, ask, ask reports is, contains the following wording. A sentence is not triggered because the criteria has not been met. That comes back to what we said earlier. That's either because the reporting group is too small or more likely at this point in time, it is because we haven't got the data yet to populate IDSR because of the issue with looked after children. So that's why we said um, throughout the webinar, please ask your school keep looking at IDSR it is updated on an ongoing basis throughout the year there isn't a new report published they just update the report on a, yeah, um, a, a, a real-time basis look at that and hopefully you will see that change over time unless you are a very very small school in which case you won't trigger as we said in response to that last question Okay, well, just to say thank you very much, folks. We have come to the end of our um, allotted time this morning. So thank you very much for all of those questions. I hope we've managed to uh, do justice to uh, the questions that have come in. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you again on uh, uh, future Governors for Schools webinars that uh, we're hosting through Better Governor. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.